Okay, it's uh, 7 o'clock. I'll call a regular meeting of the City Council to order. I ask you to join me in a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Please respect the flag. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We didn't have any guests sign in. It brings us to department reports. Michael? All right. One more. Um, no one showed up for my financial report. I'm upset. That's why they're not here. Mike. That's it. They knew it was going to present this. So. Um, let's see. Where do we start? Uh, first, let's see the agenda. I think it's on there. Is the handbook on there? Is it on? No. Um, I want to present back to you. Uh, you guys should have had an email copy to you. Dave, I'd provide you with a, a hard copy if you'd like. Um, of the handbook. Um, a few months ago, I submitted that to Dave McCauley for his legal review. Um, we met yesterday afternoon, um, discussed some of his thoughts, um, we went back and edited that, and uh, had a final copy um, yesterday evening, and you should have that in your, uh, actually you should have that in your council packet. Um, again, uh, we've, we've given a copy to you all in the past. Uh, we had anticipated having this um, approved in June so it could start the fiscal year out. So we're on, you, you now have a copy of that. Um, and uh, it's looked through our, uh, of course, council's had a, an opportunity to look at it. I've, I've, I've taken into consideration, included some of your all's feedback. Uh, we did give it to our senior staff and department heads. Uh, they had some inquiries and we took that into consideration. Um, again, Mr. McCauley's reviewed it from a legal perspective. Even on some of the issues, we had an opportunity for one of our risk management folks with our insurance company to take a look at some of the language and they provided feedback as well. Um, this was derived from several different handbooks, uh, one with the Upshur County, a couple of neighboring municipalities, um, some municipalities out of state, uh, compliance with some federal laws that needed to be in there for certain things like family medical leave and equal employment opportunity, and also some of my, my personal experiences in doing some of these things in the past. Um, so from my standpoint, um, the editing from, from our office is finished um, and it's ready for submission and consideration of approval by council. We, <coughs> we have had this for some time, everybody, but Ron, we've, we've been batting this thing back and forth for several years, but all of us on presently on council, with the exception of Ron, have been looking at this and I think it's time for us to pass it. I would entertain a motion to adopt this uh, City of Buchanan employee handbook. Well, let me ask Kenny, has, has Ron had an opportunity to go through the whole thing? Yeah, I, I read the whole thing today, as a matter of fact, David, and, and i got to say that this is one of the most simplistic, able to understand handbooks that I have ever read as far as an employee's handbook goes, and I've seen plenty of them, uh, and, and I think it's a really good handbook. Uh, you guys have done a, a great job on this, Michael, who never worked on this. Thank you, Ron. Michael, are there any areas that you're concerned about, or do you think it's... Uh, no, 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 not really, but I, I will mention this, and, and I want to mention this to Council, and, and, and our department heads that are here, and I mentioned this also to our department heads that are not in attendance. This is a working document. Um, as federal laws change, anything with the state or anything that comes up, once this is released to our employees, I'm sure there will be an employee or two, or maybe a few that will have an issue with something in it or would like some clarification on it or something we may need to tighten up. But the framework of this is, 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 is I mean, I'm not I'm not patting myself or anyone to participate in this on the back, but it's a pretty good handbook. It's a great start. And really to have uh, have an absence of this over the past several years. And there's actually one instance, uh, that uh, situation that happened just recently where this handbook would have really came in handy um, and, and the language in that and, and helping out one of our department has a personnel issue. Um, so that kind of helped expedite this process along a little bit too. So, I mean, I know we've cracked at this for several years and went through several different handbooks. Um, and, and, and I appreciate Ron's 
Ron's comments on that because we tried to simplify this as much and make it legible. From my standpoint as an employee, there are two things I wish I would have had when I came in the door. One is a handbook, the other is codified ordinances for reference. I'll address a little bit of that tonight. But um, in its present form, I think it's a good handbook. Understanding, again, it's a working document. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't really pigeonhole us in certain issues. I know that was a concern of, of, of Dave in the past. Um, but it does get some things down and, and it helps us in compliance and helps us and gives our department heads certainly a guideline in uh, administration and helping them along. Assuming this is passed this evening, um, how will it, will it be rolled out to employees? Probably Monday. Um, I'll, I'll give a copy in the department heads. If you'll note, the very last page is um, a disclaimer and notification that each employee receives mm -hmm. that. Um, so they can sign off on that, and each one of these disclaimers will be put in each employee's box, and any new additional employees that we get part-time, full-time, whatever, we'll get a copy of this so they understand um, They understand the policies that, that the city of Buchanan has for this. Have You said the uh, supervisors have reviewed it. Have, have all the employees had a chance to have input into this or not? No. No. I, I, quite honestly, um, in doing that, in a way, you're going to get 80 different opinions. Sure. And this thing would never be where it's at today in that form. I mean, everybody has a thought. Again, I'll reiterate back to what I was saying. If you, once we pass this out to 80 employees, there's going to be someone that's going to have, it, have an issue or have a comment with it. Um, and, you know, I, I think in, in putting that, the, the more eyes that see that, and, and um, you know, I think it, it, it kind of creates itself to have um, a long process. And we'll, we'll, just, we'll just kick this thing around to be honest with you all. But the value of department heads from that aspect, because department heads from an HR standpoint and dealing with their employees and the things that they experience, um, their input was, was greatly appreciated and taken into consideration. And some of these, some of the policies in here were were, were somewhat changed uh, to accommodate those departments. Um, different departments do different things. Um, <clears throat> as far as CEPA requirements um, and taking that into consideration, that's one aspect in the book. I'll, I'll pick that out where departments are different. Uh, we're requiring all of our employees to wear seatbelts. Well, the folks in the trash truck can't actually do that. And then you throw in the fact that we have police and fire under civil service, so they're under certain guidelines. Um, our water department has management guidelines, they, so they already have some quasi-employee handbook in place. So taking all that into consideration and still being able to bring everyone under one umbrella uh, wasn't really my goal in this formula. And as you point out, <coughs> this is a live document. It, it's subject to, to amendment as, as the need arises. I would entertain, I, again, I, I, entertain a motion to adopt this. Uh, Davey has a well way to you get the motion. Now. I have some comments. So I'll make that motion. Motion to adopt. There a second. Second. Motion made and second. Discussion. Uh, I would make one suggestion, <coughs> Michael, is that when uh, provide all the employees with their copy, it might be good to have a cover letter with that uh, highlighting that it is a working document and that it's something that is really there to help protect the employee and the employer. And that uh, I just think it's, it's, you know, this is a big event for a lot of employees that have never had a handbook and uh, we're doing it to really help them and protect them also ourselves too and so I think that's really important to, to emphasize the the last page of the document uh, itself uh, just inside the disclaimer says the city's HR manager in collaboration with the city council city's utility boards and city supervisors will not less than annually review the provisions of this handbook and propose amendments to these provisions as are deemed reasonable necessary or appropriate so I mean, we've, yeah. he's actually built into this yeah. a, a requirement that we take a look at annually. But I, I'm just suggesting that he might put a little note on the front of it just saying, here it is, this is why it was done. So, it, I mean, everybody's going to get a copy of it Monday, basically. Yes. Further discussion? All in favor of adopting the handbook signify so the saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Unanimous. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to, to please this council and the mayor to, to maybe just wrap everything financial up in my report 
and consider moving a consent agenda down to resolution 21206, which is the budget adjustment for general fund, if you don't mind. Very good. Um, what you'll have in front of you is resolution 2012-06. As you all know, um, those that have been on council, that um, we have a budget revision once we get our uh, fund balance at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we have to make some adjustments um, every year and submit that back to the auditor by the, by the end of July. And that's what you have in front of you tonight. Um, I do want to make some comments, if you don't mind. Um, in, in placing of this resolution, we, we actually had a fund balance. We originally had budgeted uh, $360,689. I knew that was going to be low. We actually ended the fiscal year at $666,325. Um, so that is that is what we'll have in our, our balance. Um, what I did with that and taking that, again, we had budgeted three, 360689 so essentially we had $305,636. Um, we, we, we needed to adjust and move around within our budget. Some of that was in the form of increasing some expenditures. And um, one of those was actually in a decrease in one of our revenue projections. Um, I'll make that note first. We originally had budgeted $1,100,000 in, uh, in our B&O tax uh, estimate collection for this fiscal year. I'm actually asking that we decrease that by $75,636 uh, to $1,024,364. I will tell you that ending the fiscal year, um, uh, last year, 2010-2011, we ended up with uh, 1327000 change. So with that in mind, we're, we're probably three, if, if everything stays constant, we're under budgeting this, uh, under budgeting this by about $300,000, two to $300,000. But, uh, you know, we've already established our budget based on that, so that gives us a little bit of wiggle room later on if, if we have to make a, a revision. Uh, the next item is under state government. Um, uh, that's uh, twenty-five thousand, um, and that is one for uh, a Five Promises Foundation grant. Deborah is not here; she could explain that. But they just received a grant from the Five, the Promise Foundation, um, and also the Riverwalk Trail grant. We originally did not have that budgeted for this fiscal year. When I met with Jerry uh, back in the winter, when we were doing the, the budget. Um, Jerry had mentioned that he figured the walk trail would be finished by the end of last fiscal year, and it was not. So we needed to put that twenty thousand because only half of that was finished and only half of that was funded. So that 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 represents that twenty thousand mark. Um, over in the expenditure side, um, under city council, you'll notice an increase of twenty five thousand um, dollars. Part of this is for funding for three survey reports and studies that need to be done uh, for the continuation of our city zoning ordinance. After t uh, 2014, uh, I'll have Rich, if Rich wants to comment a little bit about, about that, if anyone has any questions on that survey and that, that research. And the other amount um, that makes up that 25000 is, again, for the codification of our existing ordinances, which, again, I believe is something that councils discussed in the past that they would like to do. We've also added an additional 50000 more for storm sewer projects. Sam will probably be happy to hear that. Should give us a total of around $120,000 for storm sewer projects, uh, particularly some of the storm issues that we have within the city. I'm sure you can probably drive around right now and see those. Um, we have an additional $10,000 more for street paving, which will bring that line up in street to $85,000. Plus, if you recall, the last council meeting um, on the 5th, you did a revision for coal tax of $68,658. Coal tax money can be used for street projects, paving, concrete sidewalk projects, um, specifically earmarked by state code. That brings the potential paving funds for street projects for available for fiscal year 2012-13 to $153,658. Uh, quite a significant increase in paving. Hopefully we can pave a lot more streets and do some sidewalks this, in this fiscal year. Uh, the remaining portion of that money out of that $305,636 uh, on, the, on the expenditure side is $140,000 in funds uh, that I'm recommending to council go into our municipal stabilization fund, also known as our rainy day fund. Our um, last virus database has been updated. 
database is updated. <coughs> um, and, and with that 140000 that will bring that total to $499,996.49 currently. Um, I will say this, that prior to passage of this budget resolution, I do want to make a note that that transfer, if, if this resolution passes of 140000 I will actually make that transfer at a later date in this calendar year, and I will advise council once that transfer has been made. But you would be approving the, that, that appropriation of 140000 for a rainy day. Um, with that said, uh, the other increase in there, um, again, is the walk trail. Um, on the expense side under street, we again did not have anything budgeted for that project as I explained earlier. Um, and that's that $20,000 which offsets the $20,000 we would receive in grants. I do want to make one other note that I've increased the housing enforcement which was currently appropriated this fiscal year at $3,000. I've increased that by $5,000 to $8,000 which will provide council with a little bit of discretion to go after some housing enforcement and some cleanup. Um, that is all I have, um, and I will ask and recommend that Council consider approval of Resolution 2012-06. Could you, could you go through that B&O? Sure. Um, B&O, the, the, current, uh, the current projection in this budget for B&O was $1,100,000. I'm asking for a decrease of 75636 it's essentially money I did not want to put in our expenditure line. But um, you had, uh, last year it was $1,327,000. $1,327,000, and I don't recall the, the, the hundreds. Past, past fiscal year. Too. Correct, correct. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm projecting it now with this budget, with this revision at $1,024,000. So essentially it's almost $300,000 less of this year's collections or anything like last year's collections. You know, essentially it's uh, two to $300,000. Well, you, you had a pretty good sizable uh, catch up from one organization last year, didn't you? No, not at, at the end of the last fiscal year we had that, if you'll recall, uh, about midway through June of the 2009-10 budget. We had a uh, we had a revision that uh, enabled us to start our, um, our municipal stabilization fund going into the last fiscal year. But this is, this that, 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 that increase in, in taxes did not go on this past fiscal year. So essentially, if you do not have a real downturn in our B&O tax, <coughs> we're going to be even in a better position. We've under-projected by 300000 okay. if you mirrored this year with last fiscal year, essentially. But I'll tell you 200000 just to be concerned. <coughs> Motion to pass resolution 2012-6, which is this budget. So moved. And a second. And a second. I think this resolution requires a roll call vote. Correct. Correct. Uh, Dave Thomas? Abstaining. Scott Preston? Yes. Uh, Ron? Yes. Uh, Pam? Yes. Myself? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Motion carries. Next item is the general fund financial report for the fiscal year ending 2012. I mean 2011, 2012. Uh, the summer ending June 30, 2012. Um, you can look through your report as I go through. Um, the city's total revenue was three million five hundred seventy-one thousand eight hundred fifty-one dollars and ten cents. Our total expenses were three million three hundred seventy-eight thousand nine hundred twenty-six dollars and eighty-seven cents, which is a positive difference of one hundred. And ninety-two thousand nine hundred twenty-four dollars and twenty-four and twenty-three cents. Um, if you recall, again, the city initially transferred at the beginning of this past fiscal year three hundred fifty-nine thousand eight hundred four dollars to the municipal stabilization fund, or what we call rainy day. Uh, the current balance, with one a whopping one hundred ninety-two dollars and forty-nine cents in interest, is three hundred fifty-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-six dollars and forty-nine cents. Um, just, just a few items just of note specifically on our B&O um, revenue. Again, I'll mention it was $1,327,240.29. That's the change date. Um, which is about $116,303.15 less than 2010-11. 
uh, which again notes the difference is the significant amount of revenue that we collected in, at the end of the of the year of that last fiscal year from uh, a specific company that had to do some revisions in their B&O tax over the previous two tax years. Um, I will note in, in the summary page, uh, the four page document, um, you can see the comparison between the 2010 actuals that we closed the year on and what we did with our 2011-12 actuals and the variance. Um, Obviously, the, the ones in brackets are actually a, a lesser value, and you can see from 2010-11 to 2011-12, we actually, over our total revenues, had, had less of about $8,915.55. $8, Just briefly, taxes, that includes your hotel, motel, your utility tax, your liquor, your oil and gas severance, and your property <coughs> tax, or your ad valorem. Your fines and fees are your courts, your citations, and your police fees. Your license and permits are your business license, your permits and your uh, franchise fees. Uh, other fees are your public, your public safety charges, surcharges that you see on your uh, utility bill. Health and safety are your police and fire fees. Charges for service are specifically stalker youth center programs and activity revenues collected. Grants is self-explanatory. Uh, Intrafund uh, continuations and charges, those are just late charges that are slapped on and other revenues are really a conglomeration of gaming video, our cat tax, our cat tag revenue and our miscellaneous revenue. And then you can go throughout and see all of the expenditures and compare the 2010, 2011, 2011, 2012 expenditures and the variance between the two. I do want to point out a few things of note under the expense line. On the first page when you look at council under their capital outlay, 127,000 of that money was the CVB property state uh, settlement out of that 137,392.17. Um, on, on the next page under City Hall under capital outlay, um, 107,285, that was all the geothermal cost for that project. On the third page under fire, under their capital outlay, you'll see 235,282.96. 158,496 dollars and 96 cents was the fire station payment. Um, under street, same page, capital outlay, the number of 264,785 and 37 cents. 134,207 dollars and 85 cents was the farmer's market. We had 40,394 storm sewer projects to pay back to the sewer department. And we had the walk trail, that first half of completion of the walk trail for $19,886.11. Continuing on to the third page of the document, fourth page of the document, I'm sorry. Uh, top of the page, it says snow removal down at Stockert Youth. I will make a, a special note of that. Stockert Youth's total expenses for last fiscal year were $229,750.29. If you look at their revenue on the first page, as noted, um, under charges of service, uh, the revenue for Stockert was $150,770.79. That revenue is a combination of all of the activities that they charge uh, for programs that they do, plus the Board of Education and Upshur County Commission contribution and private donations that folks make to Stockert. Um, the difference between the, the expense for Stockard for that for last fiscal year and the revenue was a negative $78,979.50. Essentially that was money that was not collected from the revenue side um, from either donations, um, program activity charges, or contributions from the Board of Education or the Commission. And that concludes my report, financial report. Um, a couple items of note, um, again, I've been presented with the employee handbook, and uh, just as a side note, uh, to remind the public, next Saturday, uh, the, the downtown part of Main Street parking will be closed after 4 o'clock uh, for car show festivities. Uh, we are working with um, getting something in the newspaper as a public service announcement. We have our parking enforcement officer who will be coming in on Saturday to, as a courtesy to, to let people know um, not to park there after 4 o'clock, and we'll also have some signage on. I just put all that into my report. So it might be brought up later on. Um, again, if you need any details, your detailed summary uh, off of your summary for any lines or any specific department, just let me know and I'll get that for you. <coughs>
That's all I have. Questions for Michael? I have some questions, but I'm going to wait until after I have a chance to sit down with Michael on a couple of things. Okay. All right. <coughs> Matt Gregory is Big Gulf Seating, Sam Ludlow, City Engineer. I have a report on the sanitary board meeting, which was held this afternoon. We had some discussion about the storm, the impact of, of the storm on our operation. Um, really had relatively little impact. Um, the plant was out of operation effectively. Our process equipment um, it is dependent on public power. We do have a generator at the plant, um, operates our control building and our disinfection, uh, but not the process equipment in the plant. We do have permanently uh, located generators at our four primary pump stations, and they operated and we were able to pump sewage to, to the plant, maintain performance of the collection system. Um, we had to refuel those generators on Sunday um, and then we used our portable generator to operate some of the smaller pump stations on, on Monday but by that time other of the pump stations had their power restored. Um, Phil Loftus recommended and we'll plan to prepare an analysis on what it would take to provide some minimal level of treatment at the plant, um, we, we of course had passed through flow and um, had some positive impact even, even at that level, uh, but uh, essentially our process was out of service during the power outage. <clears throat> we also discussed the issue with the NPDS permit uh, that we've talked about here a number of times. The Sanitary Board did appeal the uh, permit as it was issued to us by DEP and the Environmental Quality Board received that appeal and uh, issued us uh, notice of a uh, hearing in September and a pre-hearing conference at the end of August. And because of our association with the Municipal Water Quality Board, uh, Water Quality Association, um, we have access to an, an attorney affiliated with that association. And um, he has agreed to represent us, and the board approved that today. Um, and he will be notifying the Environmental Quality Board of his involvement in this case and probably requesting a delay in the, in the hearing and the conference. Um, I think that we're very fortunate to, to have him involved um, with us and of course our objective is to negotiate with DEP and resolve our concerns which our concerns are not to do things to improve performance, but to find out what, what can be purposeful and cost effective in, in uh, making the upgrades and attempting to do the things that they're seeking from us, as well as do the things that we think are necessary to maintain the performance of the system. And very much associated with the permit, is our combined sewer overflow program, which the permit uh, included orders um, for us to perform certain actions, one of which uh, was a carryover uh, from the previous permit to upgrade our long-term control plan on how we're attempting to uh, control the overflows that occur in storms like this afternoon. Um, we had one of the first approved long-term control plans back in 2005 
and DEP very soon after that made some changes, modifications in their policies and asked us to uh, update our plan. And we have uh, provided them with an updated plan um, in, at the end of June, this past, past June. Uh, we continue to propose to upgrade sewers which not only helps us remove extraneous flow, but helps us to uh, improve service to our customers. And there are other alternatives, uh, treatment of the overflows, increased capacity at the treatment plant, and surge storage. Um, and they're all pretty expensive. All the alternatives are pretty expensive. But none of those alternatives provide any benefit to the customers. So we, we think the alternative that provides benefit to the customers as, as well as controlling the overflows is uh, the best approach, and that's what we propose to DEP. Um, and then, so many of these items are interrelated. We uh, reported on a meeting with Tennerton PSD at which meeting we discussed several items, including the NPDES permit and the combined sewer overflows and the potential impact on, on them and the importance of cooperation between Tennyson and Buchanan to address uh, extraneous flow, the overflows, and the treatment requirements because whatever expense we incur will be shared with, with them, so they would have that expense as well. And one of our primary purposes was to report on some flow studies that we had done winter before last, in which we identified what we thought was considerable extraneous flow coming from Tennerton, and they kind of preempted us in that discussion by advising us before we could say anything that they had already discovered that. So we, we were very pleased with that, uh, that response. <clears throat> we also talked about the East Main Street uh, sewer upgrade. We've completed the work on the East Main, but have chosen to go ahead and extend the line across to Sedgwick Street. Um, that had always been part of that project. And when we got it, we, we had excluded it because of the need to, to get on it and, and complete the East Main <coughs> project as part of the sidewalk project. But when we found the conditions of that pipeline, uh, we, we put it back in the project. Um, and it's also good to report that the issues with the library are resolved and they are on the, the new sewer. And we talked about our, our next major sewer upgrade project would be on Mark Avenue, Highland Drive, um, out at the end of Victoria Street, and we did some work there at the end of last summer, um, working out arrangements with the residents in that area, property owners, and plan to proceed with that project. Probably before that we do that, we had some more issues with the force main, uh, this time on the access road down into the treatment plant, and we're going to have to replace about 200 feet of, of that pressure line coming into the plant. And we uh, have talked about hiring another employee, and I think it's interesting to note we did, we did hire another employee, and he's a grandson of Boyd Heron, who was a a long-time employee of the waste department uh, drove a garbage truck and was a very effective employee and we hope his grandson does as well. That was all. Question for Sam. Sam, on the, uh, the requirements by the DEP, um, are they requiring the same standards with other cities, municipalities, counties, and so forth? Well, every discharge has its own 
requirements, and they, they use the same standards, calculations, but, but every condition is different. And our requirements are driven by the conditions of the Buchanan River, the chemical conditions in the river and the flow conditions in the river. So because the flow in the Buchanan River here is different than the conditions at Philippi or Fairmont or at Parkersburg at the Ohio River, all of those uh, discharge requirements would be different. And ours are extremely severe because of the condition of the Buchanan River at this location. It's a very high quality river with potentially very low flow. And that, that combination makes a condition where we have to have a, an exceptionally good effluent. But, you, but you're maintaining that they're, what they're seeking is much beyond what we ought to be doing. Well, there's a couple of things that, that we're uncomfortable with. Um, they're, they're pushing us in a lot of different directions at one time, and, and they, they made comments when we went down to meet with them particularly regarding the combined sewer overflows to plan our activities as if funding wasn't an issue. So I think that leads to very poor management decisions about what you're going to do. Um, so we'd, we'd like clarification on that. What, do they want us to address toxic pollutants that have very limited impact Time-wise, I mean, that, the, the issues with that occur in very short durations of time. Or do they want us to focus on maintenance of the plant? Some of the issues we have with that. Or do they want us to focus on the combined sewer overflows? Um, and, and surely we have to do some of all of those things. But what what is the real concern that they have? And the toxic pollutants which is the copper and the zinc and, and heavy metals. <coughs> they're, they're particularly difficult. We, our processes maybe take out 40% or 50%, but they're not geared to, to taking out to the levels that they're requiring. And you might get that in an industrial process. You, you, you might have an effective treatment but you wouldn't take it down to the levels that they're looking at us removing it. So they're just very extreme. Yeah, have you been facing this kind of environment before? Or is this a change in the administration <coughs> with the people at the uh, DEP? Or is it, I mean, that's what we, I'm trying to get We've had the same discussion the last two permit cycles. And how long are the permit cycles? Mm -hmm. They're generally five years. I think one of them, because of some administrative matters with the state, was seven. But the cycles are five years. But we still have safe water. I mean, we're. Your Excuse opinion. me. I mean, we still everything you think is under compliance that it ought to be. You think it, you think they're overdoing it? Yes. Oh well. It's not that these matters aren't of concern. But we, we think was an issue five years ago. And of course, we take zinc pills. We, we do, people do. Um, if you got a cold, you take zinc pills to help relieve symptoms of a cold. So zinc isn't an issue for, for us, but zinc is pretty toxic for aquatic microorganisms. And, uh, we have. We had very severe limits. We wrote a report about it, and there, there's no particular industry in the community or source in the community that we could target and have them reduce their discharge. And these heavy metals are found in the common household products that we all use. Not, not only cold medicine, and 
we uh, we had a consulting engineer in firm advise us on the cost of taking the zinc level from what we were commonly getting to what the permit levels would be. And their uh, suggestions were processes that would cost between five and eight million dollars as an add-on to take out a few parts per billion of zinc, which would be important a few weeks every ten years. And our concern is that's not how we want to spend our money. Right. And, and we're continuing to have that discussion, disagreement with, with the people. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tom and Kelly, who's turn? That's my turn. We too had uh, the storm. We had we was fortunate to have generators at the plant uh, that the plant could run pretty much normal and at the intake. We had a little issue at the uh, temperature pump station. We needed a generator there that would actually pump the stony run brushy fork into Adrian PSD. We was fortunate that the mayor, through the mayor and Tom, they got one out of Pennsylvania that would run that pump station. So. We was pretty much normal as far as keeping water uh, to Buckhannon and to all our PSDs. Uh, everything else, you know, run pretty much normal in that. Diesel, we had it topped off to where it wasn't an issue. So other things of interest that we have been working on is the East Main Street project. The last service was completed today. Now we're going to go back in and get some concrete in the streets so that the street department can blacktop the streets where we cut in valves. And then we'll, we'll be pulling out there. Uh, we've done some tank painting where we had some graffiti at the plow tank and also uh, the house the tank. We've uh, had some issues with leaks, not particularly our leaks, but uh, I'll just leave it at. Uh, one of our commercial customers had a couple leaks that was causing some issues with our tenor to pump station. We was ended up running both pumps like 16 hours a day just to supply water uh, to the Tennerton area and uh, you know, the high school in that area. So, but those have been taken care of now. We helped the customer repair their issues. And we had one that we had to repair. Royal Water, we're going to be going to a conference August the 12th through the 15th. This is every year. During the conference, you actually take in classes, which is very beneficial to what we get into as far as our... Uh, we have to have so many CEUs each year to get our license renewed as far as plant operators. And not too much more I have other than we're continuing to paint hydrants and you know, do general, general work. Questions for Kelly? Thanks, Kelly. The is not here. Dave McCauley. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> uh, most of my time the last week or so has been involved with uh, assisting Michael with the employee handbook revisions, as well as the two ordinances that I'm going to present to you under new business. Some other things that are kind of hanging out there. Uh, the mayor and Rich and I need to get together here sometime in the next few days. We had been discussing uh, doing a new ordinance relative to our electrical inspections. And uh, there's some issues as to which way we're going to go or not go with things. But that's probably the next ordinance that will be coming at you, unless it's the uh, ordinance relative to outdoor smoking. But I also have some uh, things to offer to you about that when that discussion occurs. Um, every uh, two years, uh, attorneys, in order to maintain their law licenses, have to undertake 24 hours worth of CLE. So last week was uh, my week to do a couple of those things. Uh, so civil practice and mediation, if we have anything involving any of that, I'll be uh, right up there with it. Hopefully we don't have to do either one of those things anytime soon. Um, I'm still finishing up some property-related documents uh, relative to the 
First Community Bank closing, which we still haven't had. There are some adjustments that need to be made on Mr. Smith's uh, plot. Nothing of a descriptional nature, but things relative to some dates and things of that sort that need to be corrected before we uh, finish those things up with First Community Bank. And uh, lastly, I had sent you all uh, an email uh, as we approach Saturday's effectuation of our noise ordinance, um, suggesting that we <coughs> consider some signage uh, at various locations as folks come into the city. I think Mr. Clemens already has the noise ordinance on our city website. That's available to everybody. The more notice that we can give folks, I think you know, we're not setting traps to try to get people so that we can cite them under the noise ordinance. The more information we can share, uh, we just want the noise to be lessened, particularly as it pertains to vehicles that come in and out of the city. Uh, so that's something that I would encourage the council to, to think about. Uh, also, uh, along that same line, uh, some short of calling it formal training, at least maybe a, an informal workshop with Mr. Clemens, who knows how to use that decibel gun, uh, with the police officers that will be uh, involved in enforcement of the noise ordinance. Just some food for thought as we move forward with noise. But our citizens should know that that ordinance does go into effect this Saturday. That's all I have until we get into your new business of the night. Thanks, David. Correspondence uh, you have in your packet here, this FEMA time material cost report from the storm and, and related. And, uh, you can see this is uh, Jay Holland put this together. Uh, you can look at it as you please. Note that uh, City of Buchanan uh, is out uh, a total of $59,241.12 as a result of that storm. And uh, we've made application to FEMA for reimbursement. And we'll see how that happens, but just for your information. Brings us to the consent agenda, which is approval minutes of July 5. Building and wiring permits, payment of the bills, you already did resolution 1206, and appointment of Marilyn Walton to the TV cable board. We'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. And a second? Second. And second. Discussion? All in favor signify so and saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Okay, request for tobacco free parks and recreation facility. What's up with that? Well, this uh, you know, is in there for discussion purposes. Uh, we had a presentation a couple of weeks or a couple of meetings ago regarding uh, uh, potential for uh, having uh, some sort of ordinance or regulation <coughs> regarding. Uh, tobacco use in our parks and at our recreation facilities. And, uh, should we or should we not? Let's uh, I just put it on here for discussion. We don't have anything formally proposed at this point. There are other places where this is being done. And, uh, and I would note that even uh, right here in Buchanan, the school board has uh, pretty definite rules in terms of tobacco usage and, uh, on school property. <clears throat> That's uh, state law. And uh, if I have ideas about this, and this is not probably something that you would just do. Surely there's folks who think that's an invasion of their rights, the, the tobacco users. and. Uh, the parks committee that I asked to volunteer back some time ago, and I got saw an email today from Michael. <coughs> they are planning another meeting, and they're about ready to present some recommendations through Consolidated Public Works Board, and maybe we ought to refer this issue to the. Consolidated Public Works Board. Ultimately, council will, will approve whatever recommendations this this group is making. And uh, does it, does the county have any anti-tobacco? I I don't know. I don't think so. But like a, the, like a, you know, up at the up the park at the, <coughs> the pool and so on. And that's on high school property, so it's 
you know, a state law, the state code says you can't even possess tobacco on the school property. So uh, that that takes care of that. But uh, maybe it is something we should uh, give serious consideration to. But my suggestion is that we that we let this take its course through this uh, committee that's working and their recommendation to consolidate. Mr. Mayor, I, um, I hesitate to take rights away from any group. Uh, but then, too, uh, I hate to have my rights violated. <laughs> uh, and, and honestly, um, as a reformed smoker, smoke free for over 10 years now, and, and please, uh, my uh, my taste for food has improved. Uh, uh, I wish I had quit years before that or not even started. It, it bothers me extremely to be around somebody that's in within 15 or 20 feet smoking. Uh, I don't see how rights can be taken as uh, it affects my health. It affects everybody's health. That's been proven. Secondary. It's not like the secondary smoke. It's not like it was back in the, uh, uh, 35, 45 years ago when you saw ads on TV saying that nine out of ten doctors smoke certain brand of cigarettes. Well, you know, <laughs> those doctors are probably dead for now anyway. But um, it, it's something that uh, needs to be given a lot of consideration. Uh, especially when it comes to taking away individual rights. Uh, but, but if it would come right down to a vote today, I'm afraid I would have to go uh, with uh, uh, protecting my rights, being able to breathe freely and, and not uh, you know, be breathing that secondhand smoke. But uh, I agree that needs to be a lot more discussion put into this and uh, consideration. One of, one of the other issues you have with with the uh, with that ordinance is the enforcement of it. Yeah. I've been thinking about that a little bit. Uh, you know, one of the one of the bad things about uh, smoking is the litter that comes with it. Oftentimes, um, and I had a lot of people tell me at the gazebo that was down in Jawbone that you know there's cigarettes all over the place. Yeah. Um, and, and I sure don't think we should promote smoking for, for uh, there were a lot of young people that were doing it down there. Um, and I, I agree with Ron. I think you know, we have to be very careful about taking rights away, but we also have to protect the rights of citizens to, to breathe uh, fresh air um, or air that's not contaminated. And when you do the enforcement, I was thinking that you know when some things when we do, we ought to just give a warning say, you know, this is a smoke-free or noise-free, whatever, and, and, and please don't do it anymore. Take their names and addresses and phone numbers. Then they do it again. You go up to another, you know, they get a fine, and then they do it again, then they can't go back to the parks anymore. Um, you know, David's made that kind of recommendations several times on different issues. But, uh, yeah, I do think we need a lot more discussion. I think consolidated the board. Uh, Kenny's probably the word to start that. In addition to looking at our parks, city property, do we have an obligation to provide a smoking area for those employees who may smoke? Is there something here or at the transfer station or at the water plant for those who do smoke to go out and smoke? And if we're providing that smoking area for employees, it's hard for me to say, why well, can't people smoke in our parks? My personal view is, if we're going to do this for the parks, you just do it for city property and you say there's no smoking on city property. That's, that's part of that discussion we need to have. That's been done in other other cities and they, yeah. uh, there is no uh, smoking on city property, county property even in, in some counties. Uh, I don't know what the ordinances were in those counties. <coughs> But I think the department heads need to have a, a say in this, you know, how it affects the various facilities that we have, if it affects it, and, and then how. So. Well, we'll poke around and see what, what's out there in terms of regulation. West, West Virginia is probably the least progressive of any of the Absolutely. states out there. That, I mean, I went fishing in Ohio a couple of weeks ago, and I belong to the Elks and the Moose, and you can 
and smoke there here, but you couldn't do it up there, even though it's a private uh, club. As far as enforcement goes, all city council members should be able to get these big water guns and just, just walk them around and the spray them. <laughs> Put that out. <laughs> That'd be fun, maybe. <laughs> I'd have to get one special rig. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's 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 move on. We'll 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 come back to this, sure. Um, Rich, you want to do this today, in American Air? You want to skip it down to the end of the meeting? Uh, what you really want to do? I'm ready to go now. If you want to. Okay. Depending on how much of it you want to. Let's let's. Uh, we've been uh, offered an opportunity, and. Uh, you, you all might want to see what he's found. Uh, the uh, telephone interview from a group on uh, Monday afternoon, Pam was there, I was there, Mayor was there, we had uh, uh, the chief of police and a community resident were there. Uh, this is a, a group that has approached us uh, with a television show called Today in America. Not NBC Today Show, but the name is Today in America. And it's hosted by uh, Terry Bradshaw. And the idea is for this particular series, they apparently run lots of different uh, topics over time. This particular series in their Discover America is called Best Places to Raise a Family. And according to their spokesperson that we talked to on Monday, they had selected Buck Cannon out as uh, one of the potential uh, communities uh, to film a probably five minute segment. And you can, we got lots of information here, so there's probably more information than we want to uh, necessarily go through this evening. But in any event, uh, let me show you some of it. They sent a link, and I'll, I'll forward this on. We had some email difficulties, so it didn't arrive until this afternoon. Otherwise, I would have included this in your packet. But they provided a, a link for uh, some further information uh, that's available online. And some of it's uh, videos. Uh, some of it is uh, just text <coughs> material. So. Innovation is the cornerstone of success in America. In order to compete in the global marketplace, businesses and individuals are continuously striving to stay ahead of the game. I'm Terry Bradshaw. You know, from emerging technologies and financial strategies to the latest healthcare developments, you would be surprised by the many factors coming into play. Welcome to Today in America. This is the kind of show that would be, uh, apparently it's shown on Discovery Channel once, uh, aired across the country, and then it's released to individual stations and they indicate uh, 19 or 20 of them that pick it up and air it uh, one or more times. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit more here. Rich, were there any other cities and uh, towns in West Virginia that were selected? They did not tell us. Uh, but we were selected in the region, so they, they were certainly not a state-by-state. -state, uh, Hello, folks. I'm Terry Bradshaw. If we end up working together, this could be the start of an exciting relationship. I encourage you to take an active role in the pre-production and development of the story. Specific details about the series are included in these materials. Please take a few minutes to review and acquaint yourself with the process. I urge you to take full advantage of this opportunity by helping us create an exciting and educational story. Now, while I'm the host and the narrator of these segments, it's your organization that lives it. Thank you very much. Hello, folks. I'm Terry Bradshaw. If we end up working together, this could be the start of an exciting And you can see here there's quite a bit of text involved. 
a uh, couple of things. One is, I mean, this uh, when you get down to it and you hear the spiel, it sounds pretty good. Uh, one of the pluses that I see in the process is the fact that uh, the segment that they would end up putting together about Buchanan uh, as being a place that's uh, nice to raise uh, kids in would end up being like a five minute chunk of video. And we would own the rights to that. And uh, Mr. McCauley is well aware of uh, dealing with video productions and uh, relatively expensive to have those done. So this, this would be an advantage to uh, Buchanan in several ways. It could be used for economic development. The college might be interested in it. Uh, it might be a showpiece that we could put on a web page or something like that. So there's some pluses. Um, they talk pretty highly. We talked for about 20, well, about a half hour, I guess, on Monday afternoon. Until you got down to the spot, what they want is $19,800. And that is certainly not an amount of money that it would take to do this thing from beginning to end. So that would be the city's, well, not necessarily the city, but the community's participation. Uh, when, do, and, when do we have to move to mobile? David? Well, that's, that's uh, part of the question that bothers me a little bit. Uh, we've got another conference call scheduled with them all tomorrow morning at 10.30. And of course, the sooner we say yes, the happier they'll be. Now, I'm certainly not going to say yes tomorrow morning because we've got to have a city attorney look at this. We've got to talk to other groups. And where are we coming from? 19,800 if, in fact, we would do it. Has, has this <coughs> show been on before? Much rich? Personally, I have not seen it. But then I don't watch Discovery Channel. And, yeah, because you know. I, I would ask, I think one of the first things I asked for, $19,800 is pretty reasonable, I think, quite frankly. But I would ask what other uh, towns that may be demographically similar to us have done this. And, and you know, they ought to give us a, a client list or something so we can call the city manager, the mayor, County Commission of other areas to see how they felt was a good return for their investment. Dave, I, I don't know, but the way the guy was coming off there, this, this is, is a segment that they're going to do on this uh, Today in America. All of their programs are not about places to raise families. Well, this is a, a segment that's going to be about raising families. And, and I think he said that they were looking for a, a cross section, and that they, how they picked Buchanan, I don't know. Maybe they picked several small communities around, and uh, maybe the first one to jump on it gets gets the ball. I don't know, but the uh, uh, I, I don't think that we'll have a big long list of places they've done this for. It's a I think we get a pretty good look at, uh, at, at the show itself and um, certainly you go into something like this with a little bit of caution because we don't want to, you know, we want to see their product before we, you know, we'll commit the, the money, but let's see the product before we write the check kind of deal. If it's 198 up front and then we never see them again, that's... Uh, that wouldn't be very bright and on do, our part. And do we have editorial rights as far as? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. We're, yeah. there'll, there'll be a contract presented to us according to what they said. Am I, am I right? The same is right, Pam, you agree? And uh, there'll be a contract presented to us, executed on their, their side, for us to, I think he said, an executed contract would come to us. Right. But he also indicated in that, uh, phone conversation that they were going to put that this thing together this fall. So they're trying to get their ducks in a row. And uh, I did take liberty to talk with uh, uh, a couple of the other organizations that might benefit from this and, and see if they'd be interested in <coughs> ponying up some money. And one said, yeah, probably could. And the other said, I'll find out. Sounds good. But uh, you know, the 198 sounds pretty big here, 
but if you split that four or five ways, it gets down to where it's affordable if everybody gets something for them. Yeah, probably, do, probably do it six or seven, eight ways. Actually. Yeah, and uh, I, I really think if it's if it's a good thing to do, and we can find out, and it's and it seems that it's a good thing to do, uh, we can find the money. We can find the money to make it happen. Uh, so. Uh, What's what you all's feel on it? I mean, do, do we do we tell them in the morning that yeah, we're we're interested in hearing more about what you have to say on this, or do we tell them nah, take it somewhere else? What do you think? I'm I, interested in how much more money other than nineteen thousand. Well, I, that cost. yeah, I don't think the the guy said that they ask for people to participate financially so that they would participate in the production. They would really come together and help them do it. You know, it's part of, you know how it works. You get free things people have a tendency to not be too interested in. And as well, if you want to do it, fine. But, but uh, to solicit our full cooperation, that if we put some money in it as a community, We'll cooperate, and we'll we'll be standing on one to make sure it's a, a, a good product. What's what's the actual name of the organization? Uh, I have the name of the show. But I'm not sure I've got. I mean, there, there ought to be a way to determine the, the today the, in America. What yeah. I said, but there, there's got to be a, a, some type of structural corporate uh, not corporate for profit structural corporate studios. And you get a better business report, or you can get uh, you know, how it's ranked with Moody's or whatever. So, I mean, you want to check the legitimacy of the organization. Certainly, certainly. certainly. Well, that I think that goes. Uh, I, I think it's worth for you guys to spend a little bit more time finding out more details about it. And if anything, if you think it's a pretty good thing that you know, the Westland CVB, the Development Authority, the County Commission. Uh, you know, maybe Rotary. There could be a lot of different uh, organizations that would support it, um, and you could always call us up, you know, for a conference call and just say, do you, "We think it's good. What do you think?" I mean, it sounds pretty exciting to think about it, but you know, yeah, also, you <clears throat> we're not quite sure. Either, right. So. Given the idea of sharing the costs among some of the various organizations here in town and, and checking out the legitimacy of the organization, etc. I think it's a great idea. We are not without our issues, but this is still a great place to live, a great place to raise kids. And if we have an opportunity to blow our horn, um, I think we ought to jump on that. And, and uh, I would say we could empower those in that conference call to use their best judgment in any kind of partial commitment or demonstration of interest. Well, they they will call us pretty promptly at 10:30. <laughs> Anyone who wants to be here, you know, we we have to keep the room quiet enough for us to. to you gonna talk. do? You gonna do it here? Right here, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. right here. And uh, it's not a conference. We put it on speakerphone. Right, but it's, it's in the room here. <coughs> so what do you say? We go ahead with this phone call tomorrow. I think it's worth pursuing. Okay. Okay. All right. I I think anytime you've got money invested to it gives you an extra incentive to see the project through right if if, if you're volunteering you have a tendency well i'm not going to do that today or something like uh, that right. if you have a financial interest you're going to see it done right kenny I, i'd ask uh one of the county commissioners to come tomorrow and uh, steve foster and, and Mark meadows and, uh, maybe the president or one of the officers of or rotary if they have a chance to come down We'll done here at first hand also. Well, if, if well a little short. We'll, well, we'll try. Yeah, to, yeah we'll run around in the morning. You want to come? Yeah, I'd like to be. We'll, we'll run around in the morning and try to see how many people we can get involved in. And, uh, uh, and we'll we'll see what comes from this, just so everybody knows that we're working on this. <coughs> David, before we get into these ordinances, Jerry, did you want to give us any update on your road show? Well, the only thing I can say right now, everything's coming together, and uh, we've got plenty of support, and we have 
people volunteering to help us from the Lewis County Car Club. They want to come over and help us. So everything's going great right now. Okay, we're, we're really looking forward to it. And we're working with the weatherman. Beg your pardon? You're working with the weatherman, too. Huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> David, go ahead. Ordinance. 366. I have two ordinances, both on first reading, uh, one of which I'm going to be pretty short with because I teased you with it last time when going through the whereases. So I'm going to read ordinance, <coughs> excuse me, 366 by caption uh, and then get into some of the substance uh, after the whereases. This is ordinance number 366 of the City of Buckingham <coughs> and ordinance one, formally establishing the position of city administrator and describing the duties, authority, and requirements associated with the position. Two, merging the duties and authority of the position of city treasurer with the duties and authority of city administrator. Three, amending ordinance number 318 of the city of Buchanan, that is the city's employees administrative ordinance, by redesignating the city administrator and not the city recorder as the administrator of ordinance number 318. And four, designating for all purposes the city administrator as the city's human resource manager for all city employees, including the employees of all of the city's utility boards. Uh, skipping over the whereases, which are embodied really within the substantive provisions of the later articles, uh, looking at Article 1, <clears throat> under the general direction and authority of the mayor and city council, the city administrator shall exercise the following duties, responsibilities, and authority on behalf of the city. Many of these things are extrapolated verbatim out of our city charter, some out of some state code provisions, some out of other city ordinances, things that have been assigned uh, to the city treasurer over the eons of time. Uh, A, develop and oversee the preparation of the city's annual operating budget. Establish administrative objectives for the budget and identify budgetary constraints. Evaluate budget proposals submitted by department heads. Develop final budget recommendations for consideration by the City Council and make oral presentations at budget hearings regarding specific budget proposals. B. Develop capital improvements programs and short and long-term financial plans for the City. Monitor the City's financial condition by regularly evaluating revenue slash expenditure trends and authorize specialized studies. Recommend to the City Council and all utility boards changes in service levels, fees, utility rates, and tax rates as necessary to maintain a sound financial condition. C. Assure efficient and responsible city operations by providing managerial leadership and direction, design and maintain organizational structure, establish major operational objectives, monitor progress and undertake necessary and corrective actions, assign project and program responsibilities to supervisors, and work with supervisors in developing administrative and departmental goals and objectives. D. Oversee the city's intergovernmental relations liaison function, representing the city with federal, state, county, and regional agencies. Advocate the city's positions on proposed legislation. E. Provide for citizen awareness of city goals and operations by maintaining close contact with citizens, responding to questions, and making public presentations. F. Oversee the administration of all public contracts, insurance matters, and personnel manual. G. Act as the purchasing agent and manage the purchase of materials, supplies, equipment, and services for which funds are provided in the budget according to the directives and mandates of West Virginia State Code and City Ordinances. H. Coordinate activities with supervisors to routinely evaluate the City's infrastructure and recommend to the City Council or Utility Boards the priority of programs or projects involving public works, public improvements, and public safety. I. Attend all meetings of the City Council and Utility Boards and report any matter concerning City Affairs under the City Administrator's supervision or direction and to attend such other meetings of the City's Departments, Utility Boards, and officials as may be required to fulfill the City Administrator's responsibilities. J. Assist the Mayor, City Council, and Utility Boards in reviewing and approving or disapproving the hiring, disciplining, promoting, terminating, or any other changes in employment for city employees, as well as recommending the appointment of supervisors to the mayor, subject to the confirmation of the city council or utility boards, and evaluate supervisor performance. K, direct and oversee the creation and maintenance of comprehensive, effective human resource management programs, policies, and systems consistent with the city council's guidance. 
direct the improvement of management systems, processes, and measurement techniques to generally improve city operations and effectiveness. L. Discharge all other duties and authorities specifically assigned by the city's charter or otherwise to the city charter, charter that are not otherwise specifically herein identified, including service as the treasurer for all city utility boards. <clears throat> Excuse me. M. Discharge all reasonable and necessary duties and authorities specifically assigned by Ordinance Number 318 or otherwise as the city's human resource manager that are not otherwise specifically herein identified, including service as the human resource manager human resource manager for all city utility boards, and then perform all such other duties and responsibilities as may be required by the laws of the United States of America, the state of West Virginia, and or city ordinances, or as otherwise directed by the mayor or city council. So those are the, that's a pretty sweeping uh, set of powers, but when we think about it, it's really nothing that is alien to the way that we have largely operated as a government for at least the past 50 years with the combined functions of city recorder, treasurer. Uh, we've seen a growth in that regard in recent years, particularly with human resource functions. So this really uh, standardizes, solidifies the authority in one person, uh, which again is not alien to the way that we have long operated. Uh, education experience, residency requirements, uh, those are all very basic things that are set forth uh, the person ultimately would have to be a resident of Upshur County, West Virginia, whoever would be hired to be the city administrator. Uh, and you get the idea. It's uh, my strong recommendation that tonight on the first of two readings that you approve Ordinance 366 of the City of Buckingham. Motion to approve Ordinance number 366 on first reading. So moved. Motion made. Second. And the second. <clears throat> Further discussion or questions? All in favor, signify so to say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Unanimous. Thank you. Next, David. This is Ordinance 367 in the City of Buckingham. I gave you a teaser draft last time just with the whereas paragraphs. And as you'll know, now we're up to 11, 12 pages of gobbledygook that I had to go in and stick things in from all over the place. Now, let me read it by caption and then I'll uh, tell you more about it. Ordinance number 367 of the City of Buckhannon and Ordinance 1, amending Ordinance number 170 of the City of Buckhannon, that is Buckhannon's Housing Enforcement Ordinance, 2, adopting the statutory provisions of Chapter 8, Article 12, Section 16A of the West Virginia Code as amended, entitled Registration of Uninhabitable Property, and 3, adopting the statutory provisions of Chapter 8, Article 12, Section 16C of the West Virginia Code as amended, entitled Registration of Vacant Buildings, Registration Fees, Procedures for Administration, and Enforcement. Um, essentially, what this ordinance would do, if the council uh, acts on it on first reading tonight, is to make some uh, amendments to Ordinance 170, which were either capable of being uh, amended or modified, due to some changes that the legislature made in 2008 and 2010 concerning municipal housing enforcement ordinances. I would also note that as I thoroughly uh, reviewed Ordinance 170, which we passed all the way back in 1974, there were uh, a series of typographical and uh, administratively inconsistent errors, if you will, some of which came about because of the passage of time and the way that the city has done things differently. Uh, fines, for example, under the Housing Enforcement Ordinance, a minimum of a $10 fine, a maximum of a $100 fine. Uh, for a long time, we have had a minimum of a $100 fine for virtually anything occurring in violation of a municipal ordinance, and of course, going to $500. The uh, West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals held since 1974 that the maximum amount of uh, jail time that could be imposed relative to the violation of any city ordinance is 30 days, not 60 days. Uh, we've still had 60 days in there going all the way back to 1974. So there's a lot of cleanup language that is contained in uh, Article 1 uh, of this proposed ordinance. I'd like to move with you, if I can, uh, over to, get the right section here, Article 2, which starts on Page eight. Page eight. 
Registration of uninhabitable property. We've been talking about this off and on for a year or two now, and this uh, is what it would do is if there is a process that you all would confirm that would allow the housing enforcement officer as part of the housing enforcement board to conduct investigations into property. Uh, it could be based upon a citizen complaint. It could be based upon uh, the housing enforcement officer observing things on his or her own, or it could be at the uh, urging of the city council. Uh, you all, as the uh, governing body, could say a housing enforcement officer take a look at uh, 1200 East Main Street or whatever the address would be, and the person, the housing enforcement officer, would go there, prepare a report that would then be submitted to the housing enforcement board, and if the housing enforcement board agrees with the uh, report as submitted by the housing enforcement officer, a fee would be uh, imposed as against the owner of that property. Uh, the fee that I have recommended, the state code does not give us a whole lot of guidance relative to the amount. Uh, I think implicitly it has to be a reasonable fee, so you couldn't say that oh, it's going to be $50,000 a year. Uh, the mayor and I had talked before I got too far along with drafting this, and mayor, you had suggested that, gee, there's a difference between somebody that's got a 1,000 or a 1,500 square foot house that's fallen apart, as opposed to maybe somebody that has a commercial or industrial facility that might be 20,000 square feet or more. Uh, it shouldn't be $10 a month or $10 a year. There ought to be some recognition uh, based upon the size of the property. So what I have proposed in here, and I believe it's uh, under section 13. 13, an owner subject to property registration pursuant to this Article 2 shall be assessed a monthly fee in the amount of two cents per square foot of the uninhabitable <coughs> structure, said square footage to be determined from the records maintained by the Upshur County Assessor's Office. Just to give you an example, I mean, let's say you have a 2,000 square foot home which would be probably a pretty typical all-American kind of home these days, <coughs> what would be the registration fee? We're talking a $40 a month charge relative to that particular structure if you went with the two cent uh, per square foot variable. If it's less than that, the fee is going to be less. Um, it, it, you could go with a lesser amount. You could go with a penny or a fraction of a penny. Uh, understand that this statute, as I read it, uh, the spirit of this was to empower municipal governments to coerce people to improve their properties. One of two ways. Either take this uninhabitable structure and effect the necessary repairs, improvements, so that it is habitable, number one, or if it's beyond the point of no return, tear the darn thing down. So that's what is intended by this fee. There are all kinds of processes that the property owner is entitled to all kinds of notice, uh, it would be virtually impossible to effect uh, any fee against any property for probably about a six month period of time just given all of the steps that the housing enforcement officer and the housing enforcement board must, the hoops they must jump through before this property or a particular property could be placed on this registry. So, uh, if I could jump down to Article 3 real quickly, registration of vacant buildings. Now, this is something different. This is not uninhabitable property, you could have a perfectly habitable structure that just happens to be in a long-term way vacant. And you might ask, well, why would we impose a fee against that kind of a property? Well, the risk of a property that is otherwise inhabitable, that is sitting there vacant for sometimes many months or many years on end, it raises the safety concerns of the community. Uh, particularly relative to our police and fire operations. So the state legislature in recognizing that says, look, we're going to let you do certain things relative to these uninhabitable or these uh, vacant structures. You, if the person who technically owns it, maybe it's an airship, maybe they all live outside of the state, they're required to do some things. They're required to designate an in-state resident to the city as part of this registration process and there is allowed to be a periodic fee assessed. Um, it seemed to me as I was drafting this, and this is up to the council, this was just my doing. Under section two, the fee that I have proposed is one cent per square foot per month for all vacant buildings. 
Um, it, it just seemed to me that if you have an uninhabitable structure, that's a worse thing to have than having one that is habitable but uh, just happens to be vacant. The council can, I had, to, I had to stick something in there. So this is all up to you all to, uh, to confirm uh, my thinking on the matter or not. As we get down to Article 4, that's the standard severability article that if any court would hold any section of this ordinance as uh, violating the state or federal constitution or whatever it might be, the other sections that aren't declared to be invalid would still be valid. And I have proposed that since you just got this earlier today from me relative to all of the substantive provisions, that as we have often done with zoning related ordinances, that we consider this on three readings. The reason that three readings helps us, you don't need to make any decisions tonight about changes. You could do that at the next meeting because relative to our charter and state law, we are permitted to amend an ordinance at any meeting at which you are not going to adopt it. So if you're going to affect substantive changes, uh, you can discuss it tonight, you can discuss it uh, between now and two weeks from now, you can discuss it at the meeting in two weeks. Uh, come back with uh, any changes that you'd like to make to it, and it would still put the council in a position to adopt it on third and final reading during your August 16th regular meeting. So it's my recommendation that you consider tonight on the first of uh, at least three readings, Ordinance 367 of the City of Lincoln. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Motion. It would seem to me that it'd be a lot easier to designate a property and find a property that is vacant, less problems involved with uh, putting the fee on there than it would be with the uninhabitable. Is that correct? I think that's a fair statement. There are some time frames associated with it. For example, if somebody's on vacation, you can't turn in your neighbor and say, oh, there's nobody living in that house. <laughs> that's not what this is about. This is about long term. Uh, it, it, again, the legislature was not particularly insightful as to what the term should be. Simply says, as established uh, by ordinance. So what I have proposed is a six month period of time. Uh, there are some exceptions to this too. Let's say that mom is getting up there in years and now uh, she needs some nursing home attention. Uh, you have a relative that owns a piece of property that's going to be in uh, maybe a hospice situation. Uh, they don't want to do anything with the house in the short haul. There are some exceptions that allow on a case-by-case -case basis for people to make application uh, with the housing enforcement officer to say, gee, uh, we have a relatively finite, determinate period of time that we're looking at uh, before uh, this property will be uh, occupied again but it's, it might be longer than the six-month period, they can request those uh, kinds of opportunities, exemptions, if you will. Now, well, what are the penalties for non-payment of these fees? Yeah, uh, well, they're, they're the, you can file a lien for the unpaid fees. Uh, they are tantamount to what would be a Liz Pendens kind of a notice. Uh, it would create an opportunity for the city to bring an action against the property owners and the state legislature specifically says that the laws of forfeiture may apply. That is to say, if the fee gets so big and you have a valuation made of the property, it's possible the property could be uh, assumed ownership-wise uh, by the city of Buchanan, subject to pre-existing liens, including state and federal, federal tax liens. Uh, the legislature, uh, with these enactments in 2008 and 2010, contrary to the way that I would have liked to have seen these uh, pieces of legislation drafted did not elevate the city lien above other pre-existing liens. This is similar to the property that we've been talking about that I said, gee, I wish the legislature would elevate the lien status that the city would take. Not only have they not done that relative to the basic housing enforcement ordinance, during these 2008 and 2010 additions, they didn't elevate the municipal lien status either above other liens. So our teeth in this actually could go on for years before anything would actually could be done to some of this uninhabitable property if they want to continue to pay their $40 or $50 uh, uh, fee.
fees on that or just not pay at all and take into, well, I'll take the lien. I'm not going to sell it for 10 years anyway. Uh, so is this really going to address the problem that we have with some of the properties that have been discussed in the, in the past? I think it, I think it will better uh, enhance the city's opportunity because what you will develop is a pool of money that can be used, uh, that must be used for those dedicated purposes of you know, going after someone's property and actually whacking the structure that's problematic. And there would be funds that would be dedicated for that very specific purpose. Um, so yeah, the other thing that is accomplished by this is the vast increase in fines that can be imposed uh, against someone who has the money to pay the fines. Um, so, yeah, I, for me to sit here and tell you that this is going to be the panacea, that this is the cure-all for every single uh, situation that could arise with a structural problem, it's not, but it's a lot more teeth and a lot more opportunity than what we have had in the past. So I think it's steps in the right direction. Would it be better not to just table and bring it up the next meeting so we all have a chance to read the whole thing? Well, we're going to do, he suggests we do three readings, so. Um, you, you can change it between now and the next meeting. Yeah, we meeting. can change it at the next meeting and still proceed on it, which is the same effect. Yeah. Yeah. We probably, I don't know whether we have to do three or we might even have to do three because it creates some revenue. I don't know, but. Uh, you only have to do two, Mayor, but uh, one thing that, since this is a housing matter uh, and it is a code matter, there's reference to the municipal building code in here, that requires us to have a public hearing on that matter, which means that there has to be a, a legal ad in the paper. Yeah. And uh, I, I just, uh, these are some pretty major steps relative to the way we have always done business in the housing enforcement area. I just, it just seems to me that in order to give the public opportunity to gain a little familiarity with what we're talking about for the council to feel good about it too it, it doesn't hurt to have that third reading as we've often done right. with housing and zoning matters i agree i recognize the intent of what we're trying to do and i'm generally in favor of that but you know, i'm just trying to process it all we sure. have three readings but i'm i'm aware of a, a home that's basically vacant been probably occupied two of the 14 years that I've been in town and it's kept up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm trying to weigh, is that a fair assessment to put on the owner of that home who actually has been maintaining it? Maintains it better than some of the homes that are occupied in my neighborhood. <laughs> so it's, it's something to be considered. But that wouldn't be considered uninhabitable. Vacant, vacant, it's vacant, vacant, it's vacant. Yeah. No, it's $240 a year, <laughs> 200,000 square foot home. So, so maybe we have to consider something like that. Well, I, I will tell you, there are a know. lot of vacant homes. Yeah. A lot of vacant homes. Sure. So. I guess what we need to come to grips with, the legislature's given you a tool. Right. The legislature determined that vacant structures are more apt to create issues for a particular community especially as it bears upon policing and fire departments, you know? Which, which kind of a house is more likely to be subject to a break-in, an arson, those kinds of things? That's what the legislature has said. We don't need to do this, but it is a tool that is available to municipalities if you choose to do it. Yeah, some of the provisions, particularly of having somebody local that's responsible for the property, regardless of whether it's vacant. I mean, I have lots of problems with just general care and upkeep of vacant structures. It's not that they're unhappy. It's just that nobody's taking care of them. Or even having somebody cut the grass. Right. Kinds a lot of times things. neighbors cut the grass just to keep it, keep it yeah. looking decent. Right. So, you know, it's not, uh, it doesn't stand out on the street. So. In, in recognizing uh, Mr. Preston's you know, point, which is well taken, uh, there's, no, there's nothing magical about that penny per right. square foot per month. You, you could make you could make it less. Yeah, I, I think the the thing that we were going after uh, more so than the vacant structures were the uninhabitable ones. Unfortunately, I think the way this plays out, I predict it'll play out, 
it's going to be more difficult to exact the fees from the owners of the uninhabitable structures. I mean, there's, there's probably some cause and effect. These, these places probably fell into a state of being uninhabitable because people maybe didn't have the funds to keep them up to begin with. Uh, whereas you probably will be more successful if you have a structure that is vacant, but nevertheless habitable, uh, there's probably greater success in exacting those fees. I will say that uh, in recent past, I've had a couple of homes that basically stood vacant for 20 years. Um, those homes eventually have disappeared, but one of the, the checks, probably one of the reasons they remain vacant, is, and as many homes in this, in this town are, that were cited with asbestos. And given the taxes weren't very high, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to spend uh, twenty-five, thirty, five thousand dollars to tear down a sizable home that's got a lot of asbestos in it, or you just let it sit there and pay the taxes? Not worth it. So I mean, you know, there are there are some issues here, but I, I think for the good of the community, we need to somehow uh, work with those issues. I think, considering the complaints we've had too from citizens in the community, that we need to start. Considering something where we can put some, some uh, do something about some of these structures, and I know there are vacant structures in town, and have been as far back as when my children were in school here. Uh, like kids use go in through the basement one day, you know, they go in there so they have a party at night, and, and nobody knows about it for months or even years until somebody actually goes in and tries to buy the property, and in the basement they find the evidence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's, a, it's a problem, yeah. and to me, a vacant property can be more dangerous than an uninhabited property as far as the health of, of our citizens and, and the people that can go in and get in trouble and never be found. I'll give you a perfect example of that, Mr. Pugh. The uh, home which is now occupied, they've restored it. It's a great place, great family. Daddy <coughs> cornered from where I live on Mead Street. Um, it was used as basically a, a warehouse uh, by a prominent family here in Buchanan for ever since the 23 years I've lived at 10 Mead Street. Um, a year, year and a half ago, there was an arson uh, situation involving this habitable structure, uh, but vacant for 20, 30 years. And uh, so this is the kind of situation that we're trying to address with this part of this. And we have complained, all of us who've been in this local government situation, for years we've complained about what we're restricted from doing because we are creatures of the legislature. <laughs> and the legislature has given us this tool. And I think we ought to take it <laughs> and, and use it a bit. So again, I would ask uh, for a motion to approve ordinance under 367 on first reading, understanding so that we're going to do three readings. Right. So moved. Motion so moved. And second. Further discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor of the motion signify so and say aye. 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 Opposed no. Ayes have. So we're moving on. Anything else, David? I think that's all I have tonight, Mayor. Okay. Talk too much already. <clears throat> Comments and announcements. Michael? Uh, I wasn't here for the last meeting, but I want to welcome Ron on board and Thank let him know I'm a resource. If he has any questions, anything, just contact the office or stop by. Jay David? No comments. Pam? None. Scott? Watermelon is particularly good for relieving the heat of the day. <laughs> <laughs> you furnish Later. I have no comments, but uh, okay. we're waiting in this great time Water in this town of Ron? God bless America. <laughs> Rich? Uh, just a couple things real quick. Uh, Kelly, you're being too uh, uh, modest, I think. I Hats off to the water department. I said this uh, last meeting, but you folks weren't here. Uh, it was nice. to didn't have any electricity, but boy, we had water. Yeah, well, didn't have any refrigeration or ice or anything, but we had water. And... Uh, Quite frankly, the rumors that were spread were obviously false. You guys were well prepared, and the city of Buckhannon is very appreciative of what you folks have been able to do. And my toilet thanked you. No. 
Yeah, that's it. And there were a lot of full bathtubs for a while. Yeah, yeah. There, there were. There were people dumping, which doesn't help the situation. I mean, we're trying to make do with the water, and uh, rumor gets out, and people fill up everything in the house, and, and then pull the plug. Um, before, you, before you start, one more thing. I'm not done. Two more things. Uh, several folks have asked for minutes from uh, city council meetings to be available. They're on the web. Uh, starting when the last meeting is out there, I'll continue to post them. You need to understand they're unofficial until they get approved here, but uh, they're out there as soon as as soon as they're done here, which does take a few days. But uh, I'll post those out there. And uh, John Waltz isn't here this evening because he's out singing in the secret garden someplace. So if you get a chance this weekend, uh, I heard him sing the other day. And, my God, he's pretty good. Better than I am. That's what I'm saying. Right? No, it isn't. Okay. <laughs> My turn? Your turn. Two things. Um, we had uh, a request from the record belt. So, Skeeter. I'll call me under a question. Yeah. I'd like to know the status of the Tucker Street property. I've been to two meetings. There's nothing been said. We've got yeah. June. There was a plan. So let's we had all the documents sent in to get all the licensing and everything taken care of, and the state didn't get one of them, and we're in the process. There's one piece of paper left, and the 10-day clock starts ticking. Just one more piece of paper. So after that piece of paper is filed, then there's 10 days to... Got it. That, got that 10-day notice, and then we can proceed. And we've got... Everything ready to go. We got the equipment, got the, got the bags, got the moon suits, got everything ready to go. Just got to cross the T's and dot the I's. And it, Jay Holland sent the document. It got lost in Charleston. So we have to resend it. Other than that, we're done. We, we, we're ready to go. Um, Record Delta uh, is doing a uh, special section which will be dedicated to sharing contributions in many outstanding area residents and celebrating the impact they have on our community. And they've chosen to feature Jerry Arnold and Michael Doss. And they're asking if we would take a <coughs> ad in the paper saying something about that. Now we traditionally do not buy advertising. But I'm asking that we uh, approve a quarter page, which is a five to 10, for $199. Any objection to that? Oh, it's a free one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a free one. There's a comment about that. Uh, I asked Michael to do this, and he would, wouldn't do this. But uh, I, know I, don't know how, I don't know how else we get word out to the public yeah. and how good our city employees are. Well, and how much we appreciate you know, And we appreciate it. And I think it's a fine idea. So, uh, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? There? Well, we we need to get this going. The advertising deadline's Friday, July twentieth. We just got it What's last tomorrow? day or two. That's tomorrow. At ten thirty. Uh, well, maybe <laughs> before that. I think if I call and tell them to do it, that we'll we'll get some kind of. Ad but but together. what are they going to talk about? The people in the ad, or are they going to do? No, we're story? we're going. To, you know, they do these <coughs> special editions, Dave. You've seen them before. They're they are going to feature Michael, and they're going to feature Jerry Arnold. They're going to do a little interview, or something. And th these are a couple of great guys in the in the it's community. It's called great people. Yeah, yeah. The great great people in the Makes community. And uh, they're <coughs> asked. I think that we we would put an ad in there to say congratulations to, to our two employees. Michael didn't know about it, he said it, but. Are they going to do this on an annual basis, or is this just a one-time? I, mean, I have a little bit of hesitation about doing that myself. I mean, I think they ought to be recognized and ought to be in the feature, the feature but I just don't know. I'm not real sure about the ad. Anybody else? How do you feel? <coughs> Fine well, with I did. Will you have, pardon me, Michael, a son or a daughter who's doing well in a dance studio, you buy an ad and the <laughs> dance broker says, Congratulations, and you know, you're doing a fun. I also rescind everything I said about Scott. Take it back. I'm now down to two counts. I think just a, it's a nice thing to do. Yeah, but I don't think it sets any precedent or anything else like that. 
It is a now, if it was you, Dave, I don't know if I'd do that. It'd probably cost you 5000 bucks to get me in there. But, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I know what you're saying, Scott. I just, I, I think the paper ought to be doing stuff like that all the time. And I've made that suggestion yeah. over the years. That, uh, you know, I made a suggestion one time, I forget who it was to, Katie, but I think every public official uh, ought to be interviewed sometime as why they love Buckhannon and why they love Upshur County. And the, the people need to get to, to know us better than just seeing us up here and the county commissioners. I think, that, I think that's a public service for a public paper. I, I, I agree with that, and I, and I think, too, that it, it's a way of, are we authorized to spend public money for this? I don't know. It, it, it's, yeah, I think we can. Do you think we are? Yeah, I okay. think we're okay. Most of the proof payment of an ad, $199 to record double. I'll move. Second? And second. Further discussion? All in favor signify so and saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Abstain. You abstain? Yeah. Motion carries. It's a tie. Well, it's 2 2. It's 2 2. two, two I vote yes. 2 2. Uh, My vote yes. The statute will do it. Favor of the motion. Yeah. 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 Sanchez not doing anything. Yeah, when you, yeah, when you abstain, it, it, it carry goes with it. Well, it goes with yeah. it. Anyway, okay. it carries. I voted for it. That broke the tie, so we don't have to discuss that. Uh, for anyone out there who cares to know, uh, <clears throat> there's an outfit by the name of Home Serve that's offering water and sewer line warranties. There, I got a letter from them that we'll be mailing a solicitation out. And um, we've had a lot of, uh, I, I get, I've had a lot of comments and calls about this over the years. Um, I don't know anything about Home Serve. It may be a very good organization. I'm, I, I, I'm not speaking against Home Serve. I, I will say to you that Service Line Warranties of America is offering this same kind of service and uh, the city council endorsed, in fact, solicited bids for someone to do this back a couple, three years ago. And we endorsed Service Line Warranties of America to provide this service. Service Line Mer Warranties of America is also endorsed by the West Virginia Municipal League and the National League of Cities. So we know that they are a reputable firm but if you want to deal with home service, that's all right. Just, just be aware that Service Line Warranties of America it has been endorsed by the City of Buckhannon, West Virginia Municipal League, and the National League of Cities. I have nothing further. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? I got one for the comment. One comment. The, uh, in the spirit of what uh, the record Dell was doing, you know, at some point in time, um, I think the, uh, the city ought to consider uh, recognition of employee of the month or employee of the year. Uh, a lot of organizations do that, and that might be something worth looking at in the future. We don't, we don't do that now, right? No. Jerry? I want to thank the city and the council and everybody that we've been working with with all the cooperation that we've received. It's really appreciated. Well, we thank you for We it. hope you do well, and, and we hope it turns into an annual event that to bring 100,000 people in here, and they all spend $1,000. We're just looking for 50000 So that all said and done, we're, we're adjourned. Thank you all for coming in.